So I've had you turn to Genesis chapter 7. If you would uh, please uh, look there, and while you're finding your place back in the 7th chapter of Genesis in your Bible, I don't think that any of us have ever been in a storm like is recorded in Genesis chapter 7. I mean, I've been in some real strong rainstorms, thunder and lightning and all the rest, where, you know, many, many inches of rain may have fallen, but we're not talking about inches. <laughs> we're talking about feet of rain that is falling, as well as other things that are bringing water all over the face of the earth. It's never rained before. It never rained before. In, the, in Bible times, it never rained before this first rain that is recorded here in Genesis chapter 7, which of course is the basis for the flood. Can you imagine how odd that might have been? And how frightening it would have been as well, because not only would there be rain, there would be thunder, there would be lightning. Uh, never heard before. Didn't understand what was going on. And uh, it's just one bright spot. I think, when I think this storm, I think darkness, dark days. But there's one bright spot in this whole chapter, and that happens to be Noah. And we meet him right in the first verse. He and his family are the only bright spot in this entire chapter. And it is because he is a man that we learned already has found grace in the eyes of the Lord. He is a man that has experienced God's mercy, a man that has been the recipient of God's kindness and also his family as well. He knew that this day when the heavens would be open, when the rain would fall, when the flood would come, he knew that this was going to happen. He was working on building this ark for 120 years. He knew the day would eventually come when God would fulfill what he said he was going to do on this earth. You know, I can remember when I was a child and I did something bad and my father may send me to my room and I had to wait and I had to wait and I had to wait until he would come to deal with me. That's a terrible feeling to wait when you have a negative event ahead of you. <laughs> that, that uh, is coming. The only redeeming factor in this is Noah and his family. It's a horrible event that we see here in the seventh chapter of Genesis regarding the flood. And uh, it's been hanging over the head of the world, really, you might say, for, for many, many years. But there's nothing to really say that it's going to happen except the word of Noah. Uh, it's sunny, the weather's beautiful, until the day when the windows of heaven open and the floods also usher up from the earth. So the first 10 verses, let me give you my, my little outline here. Verses 1 to 10 of Genesis 7, I call that sheltering in place and that's when they go into the ark and they're in that ark for a good while we'll talk about that in a moment and then verses 11 to 24 the rest of the chapter sheltering in place followed by staring death in the face they're staring death in the face but the people that did not enter that ark with them they stared death in the face and it overcame them. So I want to take a moment and pray and then look at this section of sheltering in place that is within the ark. Heavenly Father, I want to thank you. I want to thank you for this passage. I want to thank you for the privilege that we have of being together and having a Bible and you speaking to us out of the Bible. And I pray that the people that are listening today would understand that this is not just a man speaking, but this is a man speaking from the Bible, the very Word of God. 
And I am trusting you, Holy Spirit, to take your word and to drive it home to every heart and accomplish your purpose. I want that, and I pray that hearts would be receptive and open. The end result, that you'd get what you desire, that you'd be pleased, that people would be brought into a right relationship with you, if that's accomplished. Lord, uh, bless your name. We just ask this for Jesus' sake. Amen. So, a week before the flood began, one week, seven days, we are told, before the flood began, there is an invitation offered by the Lord to Noah and his family. And that invitation is that they come into the ark. God invited them to enter into the ark. Look at it in verse 1. The Lord said unto Noah, Come, thou and all thy house or thy family, into the ark. It begins with an invitation, the seventh chapter. And I think that that is so important. That's really what the Bible is all about. The Bible is all about God inviting people to come to him, to come into a relationship with him, to come to know him, to come to depend upon him, to come to trust him. In fact, Jesus said it this way. He said, come, come unto me. God says here, come into the ark. Jesus says, come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, I will give you rest. And isn't it interesting that the name Noah means rest? An invitation. That invitation to come to God, that invitation to come to Jesus is really the answer to everything in life. It's the answer to everything that you, every problem you have is found in coming to God and coming to Jesus. There's your answer. Whatever it is that troubles you, whatever problem, or there's the solution. And when they took advantage of that invitation and they entered that ark a week before the flood actually began, little did they know they would be in shutdown for an entire year and a little more. And uh, so they're invited in. For seven days, it's still sunny. For seven days, nothing's happening. And they're in a waiting pattern. They're waiting. That's one of the most difficult things that people have to do, is wait. I don't know about you, but it's a difficult thing for me to wait. And it's even more difficult when you're in a, a problem. When you are suffering in some way, in some measure, waiting is even more difficult, isn't it? I can remember a particular problem that I was dealing with, serious problem with, with uh, uh, someone whose loved one was, was passing away. And I remember asking the Lord, what should I share with them? And, and the Lord laid on my heart Psalm 27, 13 and 14. I think it goes something like this. I would have fainted had I not believed to see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. That is the here and now. And then uh, it, uh, the verse, next verse says, Wait on the Lord, be of good courage, and he shall strengthen thine heart. Wait, I say, on the Lord. And so waiting on the Lord is waiting patiently, it's waiting in faith, and that's really what I want to show you next. And that is that while they are sheltered in place, Noah and his family are trustful. That is, they're full of trust in the Lord. Noah is a man that is said to have walked with God. He was a man that obviously worked for God. You know, it took 120 years to build that boat. So he walked with God. He worked with God, and uh, he was a man that, that let God direct his entire life. He let God direct his schedule. Okay, so why are we in this boat seven days and it's sunshine? How long are we going to be here? He let God direct his schedule. I don't know if you do that. He was trustful. He let God uh, direct his actions, his work, what God would have him to do. 
He let the Lord be the one that would provide he and his family's needs. He was trustful of God. He was, he, he was trusting God for whatever would happen to him or his family. He was trusting God for the future. Reminds us of that famous passage in the Proverbs, right? Trust in the Lord with all thine heart, and lean not into thine, unto thine own understanding, and all thy ways acknowledge him. And what's the promise? He'll direct your paths. And then the next verse we often leave out says, be not wise in your own eyes. Don't be wise in your own conceits. Don't think that you can direct your own way and figure it out yourself, but be trustful. So here's a man sheltering in place, and he's trustful. Are you sheltered in place? Are you trustful? Or are you fretful? And then something else here. He's peaceful. I see here because he's trusting God. When you trust God, you, that means you believe God's word, you believe God's promise, and uh, you thus obediently follow God's plan, God's instruction. And when you're in that position, you have nothing to fear. And so when you're trustful, you end up being peaceful as well, being full of peace, fearing nothing. Are you worried about what's going to happen in the future? Are there things that, uh, that steal you, your peace from you, rob you of your peace? I, of course, was brought up in a Christian home. My dad was a pastor for many years. He's now with the Lord. My mother is 94 years old, and my, my mother is a godly Christian woman. But my mother worries. She has areas that cause her worry, and one of the biggest areas is that she lives in a mobile home, and whenever there is a weather forecast that predicts strong winds, she gets really fearful. And uh, she often calls me. And uh, we, we talk. We talk it through. And it happened recently again. And I, I told her, Mom, you, you watch too much weather. Uh, stop watching the weather reports all the time. But uh, can't, she can't. She's, that's all she has. So she gets stirred up. And I, I share with her various things. And uh, I said to her in a respectful way, I want you to understand, I said it in a respectful way. I said, Mom, you're 94 years old, and you still haven't learned to trust the Lord when things like this happen? And uh, she says, I'm still learning. <laughs> 94 years old, still we're still learning to trust the Lord. Yeah, I think we'll, we're always going to have those kinds of, those areas in our life. But folks, we need to learn that we can experience the peace of God. Great peace have they which love God's word. Nothing causes them to stumble. Thou will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is focused on you. Or, as uh, Philippians says, don't be anxious. Don't worry about anything. But in everything by prayer and supplication, that's letting your need be made known to God with thanksgiving. Don't leave that out. Let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God that is beyond human exp explanation, human understanding, will keep, will guard, literally, will stand guard duty over your heart and mind through Christ Jesus. And so here they are, sheltered in place. He's trustful, and because he's trustful, he is peaceful as well. An emphasis here, really, in this passage of God's careful provision for them and uh, how, to, how, to, how to approach, how to have a steady approach to a crisis. I think you find it right here in these first five verses. God says, come. He welcomes them into the ark. He welcomes them to enter into a place where they will be sheltered and they will be provided for. And the implication of that, uh, that phraseology in that first verse of chapter 7, when God says, come, is that 
I'll be waiting in there for you, to welcome you, and to be with you. And that's exactly what we have to get a hold of. If we're going to be trustful and peaceful, we have to recognize that God's sheltered in place with us, and he, he's, he's here. He's on board. Carest thou not that we perish? Peace be still. If he's on board, how's the boat going to sink? And that's the key. So he's trustful as he's sheltered in place. He's peaceful, but he's also restful. In fact, as I said a moment ago, his very name in Hebrew, Noach, means rest. And he has been the instrument in his family so that his whole family really appears to be restful as well and peaceful and trustful. He's the instrument that, that God's used he has submitted to God's leading, and so his family has as well. And you know, it wouldn't have been easy to follow God's instruction, especially when you're the only people in the whole area or the whole world. You're running counter to the norm of society and, uh, and, uh, and worldly wisdom. You know, he was restful. There's a little bit difference between being peaceful and being restful, or being trustful and restful. You know what it means to rest in the Lord? I think really the, the definition is in Hebrews 4.10, and basically it says this, that if you're resting, you've ceased from your own works. You've stopped working your plan. You stopped trying to make it happen yourself and you are completely cast upon the Lord. That's what it means to be restful. You cease from your own work. Look, if you think that there is something that you can do to gain you favor in the eyes of God, you've never come to a place of spiritual rest in your life. But you can trust the Lord, and you can rest in the Lord for your eternal salvation. And yet, how often do we, as believers, though we have trusted the Lord for the greatest thing ever, how often we're not restful, we don't cease working to make God happy or get ourselves in with God better, earn his favor as believers, or forget God's plan, we work our own plan, and we don't cease from our own works, and we're not restful. They entered the ark. We're going to see in a moment, God shut the door. Ad or, uh, Noah didn't shut the door. Neither did any of his sons. God shut the door after they entered the ark. Verse 16 says that God made it secure. See that? They went in and as God commanded him, and the Lord shut him in. It's God that uh, guarantees their security. God shut them in. And you know what? When they went in and God shut the door on them, I don't think that they had any idea how long they were going to be in there. They didn't know how long they would be locked up in, the, in that boat. And it was a year plus. But what mattered to them, and I think what ought to matter to us, to us as well, is all that mattered to them was that God knew. They left it with God, and they rested in that. Can you leave it all to God? Can you do that? Whatever it is you're facing, whatever it is you're struggling with, can you leave it to God? If you can, you can rest. If you can't, you'll not rest. Even animals were included. It was all left to God. I think of that uh, scripture that Jesus said that the Lord cares for the, the sparrows. Not one sparrow falls that the Lord doesn't know about. He cares for the birds of the air. He feeds them, right? He makes sure they have food. I came across a, a, a poem that I wanted to share quickly with you. Listen to it. It's cute, but it gets the point across. It said, the robin to the sparrow, I would really like to know why these ancient, anxious human beings rush about and worry so? Said the sparrow to the robin, Friend, 
I think that it must be that they have no heavenly father such as cares for you and me. I wonder what kind of impression we give to people that are viewing our lives. We're sheltered in place. Are we trustful? Are we peaceful? Are we restful? Noah and his family was. Sheltered in place, staring death in the face. And I want you to look with me in verse 11. It says, in the 600th year of Noah's life, in the second month, the 17th day of the month, the same day were all, look at this, fountains of the great deep broken up, and the windows of heaven were open, and the rain was upon the earth 40 days and 40 nights. Now there's a word that pops up several times to indicate the severity and the greatness of this water. And I want you to see it with me first. If you would uh, look at uh, verse 18, it says, And the waters, here's the word, prevailed and were greatly increased upon the earth. And the ark went upon the face of the waters. Verse 19, And the waters prevailed exceedingly upon the earth. Uh, verse 20, Fifteen cubits upward did the waters prevail. The mountains were covered. And uh, then verse 21, All flesh died that moved upon the earth, and uh, every living thing died. And then verse 24, And the waters prevailed upon the earth 150 days. See the repetition of the word prevailed? It's an interesting word. It's a word that uh, means mighty. And it, it's the same root word that we saw in chapter 6 and verse 4 when it says there were giants in the earth in those days. And also after that, when the sons of God came in unto the daughters of men, and they bear children to them, the same became mighty men. Same root word, mighty men. Waters prevailing, what do I mean? It was those mighty men that brought about the necessity of God having to destroy all living creatures on the earth. And those gabor, those mighty men, God, Gabar, God prevailed over. He was more mighty than they were. And what we have beginning in verse 11 and down through verse 24 is judgment on the world. A world really that was over the edge in wickedness. A world that was depraved and degenerate. And God is dealing with it. And it's vital that he does because if you were with us for our study of Genesis chapter 6, you realize that... Uh, that in order to counter Satan's plan to bring about a supernatural, powerful, and immortal race, God had to prevail over them. God had to prevail and thus prevent that because what they were trying to do, what Satan's plan was to prevent the seed, the Messiah that was promised in Genesis 3.15. And so God had to judge the earth and to totally eliminate, wipe out, blot out this superhuman race with complete destruction. However, while Noah built the ark, he also preached God's truth to the people around him. Did you know that? 2 Peter chapter 2 and verse 5 says that Noah was a preacher of righteousness. He preached. All the while he was building the ark, he was also preaching the truth of God to people. And I'll guarantee you he was calling them to repentance. He was not only telling them about the judgment that was to come, but he was telling them how they could avoid that judgment. How if they would repent, they would not face that judgment. God mercifully waited while that ark was being built 120 years, over a century, for people to repent. 
based upon the message of uh, truth, of the word of God, that this preacher of righteousness, Noah, was preaching. God gives people ample opportunity to repent. Don't think for a moment that, uh, that, no, that, that there are people on this earth that don't have a chance. God is the kind of God that sees to it that everyone has the opportunity to repent if they want to. And that includes you. That includes me, all of us. And can you imagine? People are different. But people are people. Of all those people that he preached the gospel to, I don't know that all of them were scoffing. I'm sure a majority were. But perhaps there were some sensitive souls that were in their own heart wondering, you know, is what he's saying right? And yet because of the pressure of the people, maybe their families around them, they refused. Even though they felt that Noah might have a point. Noah's message might be true. They refused and thus they were destroyed. You know, maybe I'm speaking to someone today that you know what the Bible says is true. And yet for some reason, maybe it's because of the, the, the culture that you're in, the climate that you're in, you're, you're afraid of what people might say or do if you accepted Jesus and the atonement that was talked about uh, a little bit ago when we looked at uh, Leviticus 17:11. Uh, your, your pressure, you know it's true in your heart, but you're unwilling to pay the price for some reason. You're unwilling because of what people around you have said or believed. I want to tell you, Jesus said it, and I'm going to repeat his words, except you repent, you will all likewise perish. And you've been warned, just as these people are warned by this preacher of righteousness, Noah. This flood was a global flood. It was, it, it, the Bible presents a universal flood and not just a local one. Uh, for example, in verse 7 of chapter 6, the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast, creeping thing, fowls of the air, for it, it, it sorrows me that I've made them because of the evil. And then in chapter 7, verse 4, seven days, God said, and then I will cause it to rain upon the earth 40 days, 40 nights, and every living substance that I have made, I will destroy from off the face of the earth. Doesn't that sound like global flood to you? And then uh, verses 18 to 23, I'm not going to read those verses, uh, but uh, verse 21 says, All flesh died that moved upon the earth, both of fowl, of cattle, of beast, every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth, and every, every man. Doesn't that sound like a global flood to you? I think that if you read Genesis 6, 7, and 8 without preconceived ideas, without bias, your viewpoint will be that I have to conclude this was a global flood. This was a flood that uh, overflowed uh, the whole earth. In fact, look at verse 11 again with me in Genesis 7. It says that uh, on that particular, at that particular time, that same day, all the fountains of the great deep were broken up and the windows of heaven were opened. There was an upheaval. There was some type of an eruption on the ocean floor. You know, there are tectonic plates that are moving under the ocean all the time. Well, there was an eruption on the ocean floor, and as a result of that, water was released out of the, the bowels of the earth, you might say, and uh, thus the ocean rose tremendously, as well, torrential rain, Gasham, torrential rain came down for 40 days. You know, I'm not into numbers. I don't put a lot of stock in numbers in the Bible, but the number 40 pops up a few times, and invariably, whenever you see the number 40 in the Bible, it always is related to some period of trial, that ends in victory. And uh, you can you think about that, think about the, uh, not only this, but think about the 40 years uh, in, the, in the desert, and uh, the, uh, there's another 40 that just slipped my mind. 
The temptation of Jesus, yeah. 40 days. So take that for what it's worth, not uh, really significant to what I want to say, but uh, what I am saying is that all of this happened, and then the ark floats, and we are told in the next chapter the actual mountain range that it, that it, uh, that it settled down on when the waters did subside, uh, the Ararat range, that he eventually settled on one of the peaks. But that indicates to us, again, that the entire earth was totally immersed in water. In 2 Peter chapter 3, and I just want to go back there myself for a moment. 2 Peter chapter 3, and I'm thinking about three verses, verses 5 through 7. Uh, Peter says, Bible deniers, who he's talking about, are willingly ignorant that the, world, that the word of God says that the heavens were of old and the earth standing out of the water and in the water, whereby the world that then was being overflowed with water perished. Notice, the world overflowed with water and perished. And then he says, and the heavens, verse 7, the earth are now by the same word kept in store, reserved unto fire against the day of judgment and the perdition of ungodly. In other words, there's another big judgment coming on this earth. And it's not going to be one of water, but it's going to be one of fire. It's not going to be done by men. It's going to be done by God, just like this uh, global flood was. And the point that I want to make is that Bible deniers refuse to consider certain data that doesn't fit their agenda. But I'm telling you that the creator of this earth has the ability to break in any time to work his plan on this, uh, on this uh, earth. And his plan here includes judgment. A world that was, it says, perished. God mercifully waited over a century for sinners to repent, but there comes a time when it's too late. There comes a time when the door is shut by God and it becomes too late. And when the thunder is rolling and the rain is pouring, it's too late. And that's why the Bible says through the prophet Isaiah, seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. You know, I, I, I think that there were probably people who in their heart knew that Noah was right and perhaps even had decided that, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to call upon, I, I'm going to believe that, I'm going to receive that truth. Uh, and they procrastinated, and it never happened, and they perished, obviously. Some sensitive souls that perished because they did not repent when they had the opportunity. But the thing that I want to conclude with is the fact that this whole thing, staring death in the face, this global flood, is a visual. It is a visual. It's a picture of salvation by faith in Jesus the Messiah. That he rescues us from a future judgment. A judgment that will be much greater than this uh, global flood. It says God shut them in, that is, Noah and his family. What a, what, what a tender, fatherly touch that is. At the brink of judgment, God shuts them in safely into the ark and then exercises that same care over them to the conclusion of their year-plus stay on that ark. They're sealed in and protected while the world is being judged. The earth is submerged by a flood, but this family of Noah is there in a safe place and they're floating above the flood. 1 Peter chapter 3 is also a, a reference to this that I think is very, very uh, insightful and helpful for our closing thoughts today. And that is in 1 Peter chapter 3, the Bible says Christ also hath once suffered for sins, the just, that's him, for the unjust, that's us, 
Why? That he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but quick and made alive by the Spirit, by the which also he went and preached unto the spirits in prison, which sometime were disobedient, when once the long suffering of God waited in the days of Noah while the ark was a preparing, wherein a few, that is, eight souls, were saved by water. And he says, The like figure whereunto even baptism doth also now save us, not the putting away of the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience toward God by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. What is he saying here? Listen to me, this is, this is very important. What he's saying here is we have a visual. The flood is a visual for us. That the flood is a picture, and the, the flood and the ark is a picture of baptism, is what he says in these verses. But more importantly, baptism is a picture of salvation. Don't miss this. Salvation is this, that Jesus, the Messiah, died for our sins, shed his blood as the sacrifice, that he was buried, and that three days later he rose again. He died, he was buried, and he rose again. And those that believe on him and that he did that for them are saved from sin picture here is, here's the visual, the earth was dead, the earth was buried, and yet the earth arose. It was, uh, the, 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 the earth rose up again in resurrection. When Noah and his family walked out of that boat after the waters had subsided, they walked onto a new earth, essentially, a new earth a resurrected earth, to save Noah and uh, his family from God's judgment, they were put into that ark. Now, listen to me. Peter reveals to us in the 21st verse of 1 Peter 3 that baptism does not wash away sin. When he uses that phraseology, that it doesn't put away the filth of the flesh. He's talking about it doesn't have the power to wash away sin. What washes away sin? We are washed from our sin by the blood of Jesus. That's it. There's even a song we sing, what can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. But Revelation 1.5 tells us that we're washed from our sin by the blood of Jesus. So that's what Peter's saying. Baptism doesn't save. But you know, Jesus commanded us to publicly identify ourselves with him in his death, burial, and resurrection through baptism. And when we obey and, ba and are baptized, you know what we do? We provide ourselves a clean conscience, a good conscience. Is that, that's what he says happens in verse 21. It gives you a good conscience. You know, you've done what, uh, what God's commanded, and that gives you a good conscience. But that ark was the key to Noah and his family's rescue. I read that during a hurricane in the Gulf of Mexico, a news report highlighted a rescue device that was used on the oil rig. In case of a fire, or in this case, a, a hurricane, the rig workers scramble into this bullet-shaped bus, not really a bus, but looks like a bus, and they strap themselves into their seats, and when the, the, the entry port is shut, the vehicle then is released down a chute, and it's projected then away from the oil rig. And then they're safe from the fire on that rig. And then the capsule just bobs in the ocean until the rescuers come to pick it up. Well, that device reminds me of what God provides for every person 
who received Jesus as their Savior. The Bible says there is therefore now no condemnation to them that are in Christ Jesus. Salvation doesn't mean that our world uh, just stops falling apart, but the rig that, uh, uh, that these men were rescued from still may topple in the hurricane, but those that were in the right place are re in that rescue module, they're safe. And the point is this, you can be safe from the coming judgment that God is going to bring to every one of us by getting into Christ. He's the rescue module, so to speak. He's the rescue device. The storm is going to take its course. The welfare of these workers depended on where they were in that rescue, whether or not they were in that rescue device or not. And I want to ask you, are you inside? Are you inside the ark of safety? Are you in Christ? Have you entered by faith into him and his saving work? That's the question that every single one of us must answer today. And if so, God has sh sheltered you in place, and you're safe, and you can be trustful, and you can be peaceful and restful, no matter what's going on around you. Let's bow together. Heavenly Father, I just pray that you might use this to convict any lost person of their need to be saved, and that we'd even hear about it, that we could help them grow in, in grace. We could help them grow in the Lord in their newfound faith. And then those of us that are already believers, Lord, teach us the same kind of trust. Give us the same kind of peace and rest that we see evidenced in the life of Noah and his family at this time. We thank you for Jesus. He is the ark of safety that spiritually rescues us from that judgment to come which every single human being one day will face. And that's why we need to be sheltered in place in Christ. And we thank you in Jesus' name.